بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين okay, so um, i'm going to like it to be like an interactive class rather than a lecture so i'm going to ask you questions and i want to hear from you guys so the topic of the class today is atheism science and islam so before we talk about atheism science and islam um, we need to understand what exactly each one of these terms mean. And that's the first step to solving any kind of uh, religious problem or uh, philosophical problem, um, is understanding the meanings of terms. And most confusions that people have, they come because people, they understand terms in different ways. So, and I'm going to illustrate that um, with, as we go through the definitions. So what's the definition of atheism? What does atheism mean? Somebody? What's her name? Anyone? One of the ladies? What's atheism? No. One of the... Yeah. Okay. So atheism says here it's the belief that there is no God. Okay, excellent. Okay, we're going to come to science last. Um, but let's go, go to Islam. What's, what does Islam mean? <laughs> Who's going to define Islam for me? Sidi Hasid. <laughs> Aren't you Muslim? <laughs> what is, what's Islam? Hmm? There is God. Bil so, uh, so the belief, so, there's, so there's somebody said, the belief that there is God. So it's the belief that there is God, but that's not sufficient because somebody could believe in God, but not be a Muslim. So you said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So it would be the belief that there is God and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is his messenger and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to tell us that we will be resurrected and we will be called uh, to account for what we did um, we'll be raised back to life and then after that we will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send us to one of two eternal abodes and inshallah all of us will go to paradise together so the the so that's that's Islam so there's stuff here that I didn't write over here but uh, but what I, want to, what I want us to think about is, so there is, so the word belief, okay, I understand what that means. Um, and that there is, there is not. But this word God, what does that mean? What does the word God mean? And, uh, and the, when, when, and uh, so there's a particular, there's a debate in contemporary uh, media and books. There's books that are written by, uh, by um, atheists, people who don't believe in God. And the people who they're talking to are Christians mainly, and Christians who do believe in God. And they're going back and forth, and they have a concept of God in their minds. And what I want to show you today is that the concept of God that we have in our minds is not the same. And, and we have to understand that because they're, otherwise we talk past each other. So somebody is talking, they're, they're, they're not believing in God, but what they mean by God is something. And I say, I do believe in God, and what I, but what I mean by God is something else. We're not connecting. And, and they often, they'll put us into the same bucket as um, a Christian who has a different conception of God, comes with different kinds of arguments, and it all becomes a confusing mess. So we're going to look at what, what uh, spend some time thinking about what the word God means to us. Um, <clears throat> so, and as we do that, there, these terms we're going to come across. I've just put them on, on the board here, and we'll, and these are important terms for us to understand. So, there's this term, science, we're going to come to it. Science is a big, it's an ambiguous thing that means many different things to many different people, and that makes it very confusing. Um, so, then there's this term called materialism. This is something we have to understand. Um, as we go through uh, today's class, there's this idea of a supernatural being, which you hear frequently, you'll hear atheists, they'll talk about this idea of a supernatural being, what exactly is meant by supernatural, we're going to um, talk about that a little bit, and, and then finally there's this idea of a necessary being, 
And it looks like a big word, necessary being, but this, is, this used to be, uh, th this has an Arabic equivalent. Uh, we call this um, Al Wujud Al Wajib. Al Wujud Al Wajib. And so this is a term in Islamic theology, and you will find it in books of tafsir. And they'll actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our, our, uh, our scholars, they were very careful about the way that they used words. And so whenever there's a word that comes up, they always define it. So if you open up the books of tafsir, uh, a, book, a book like Tafsir al-Baydawi, which has uh, you know, been, been on, on the curricula of our tra traditional um, seminaries for centuries all over the world, when you, the first time the word Allah is mentioned in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, He's going to give a definition for it. He's going to tell you who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And he's going to tell you, like uh, every other scholar in any of the Islamic sciences, he's going to tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wujud al-wajib. He's a necessary being. So this used to be part of normal Muslim vocabulary. So anybody, we, any, any Muslim, when they, when they study, when they learn about their religion, they understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wujud al-wajib. So it's, for us now, it's not as familiar, but I'll, I'll, I'm, going to, I'm going to be, inshallah, I hope that I'll explain this to you. Um, and, uh, but but it, uh, it seems like something that's a complicated, foreign thing that we haven't heard before, but I just want to tell you that this is something that's very, very familiar to our tradition. And, and it used to be part of our basic Islamic vocabulary. So uh, what is al-wujud al-wajib? So there's a surah that we all know, uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ So the second verse Allahu الصَّمَدْ الصَّمَدْ The word الصَّمَدْ um, in, it, means, it means the one who uh, Allahu الصَّمَدْ It means Allah is the one who everyone needs but He doesn't need anyone Allah is the one who everyone needs, but He doesn't need anyone. So this is, this is a very profound concept. So when I, so let me, let me now, uh, let's begin by, so we'll begin here, belief that there is a God, and that this God is as samad and what that means, and how we know that that's, uh, that that's, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So let's look at the, let's look at the universe. Okay, we look at the universe. The universe is not necessary. The universe is dependent. Everything in the universe is dependent. Everything in the universe is dependent. Everything in the universe is dependent on something else. This is the nature of the universe. So if I, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say that I, you know, I, for example, I get sick. I get sick. So this, this thing, I got, you're gonna, you, what, what are you going to say? I'm going to go to a doctor, and the doctor is going to tell me why I got sick and how I can get better again. So I got sick. My sickness is a dependent, it's something that's dependent. What does it mean it's dependent? It means that something needs to make me sick it's not just there something needs to make me sick um, if when I get healthy again that's also a dependent phenomenon it means something needs to make me healthy when it rains you ask the question why does it rain right? a meteorolo me meteorologist will tell you why it rains right? different air pressures uh, you know, precipitation water vapor, clouds, wind, there's, there's things that, that rain needs to be caused by something else. Um, when I look at uh, you know, the sun, the sun is shining. What makes the sun shine? So we, the scientists will ask that question, what makes the sun shine? What makes the sun shine? Is that, who's that? Uh, Ahmed and Well, somebody tell me, what makes the sun shine? What makes the sun shine? Nuclear fission. <laughs> nuclear fusion. Fusion. Nuclear fusion. So you have hydrogen atoms, a lot of them. You have the force of gravity. 
And the force of gravity, because of the force of gravity, ah, force, because come, maybe we'll talk a bit about forces, but because of the way that, the way that it's described is for, the force of gravity pulls the hydrogen atoms together, they come together, they fuse. Hydrogen atoms become helium atoms, other kinds of atoms. When they fuse, there's some mass that's lost and that mass is released as energy. That's e equals mc squared. So the, that's released as energy and that energy that we, that's released, that's the shining of the sun. So the mechanics are not important. What's important is that when I looked at the sun, I say what made the sun shine. I look at the sky, I say what makes the sky blue. I look at the wind and I say what makes the wind blow. I look at this green carpet, I say what makes this carpet green. Everything in the universe, I say what made it this way, 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 what made it this way. What does that mean? It means that everything in the universe is dependent on something else. It means that I see, I as a human being, when I look at the things in the universe, I can see that everything in the universe is in need. And that everybody sees this. The atheist sees this. He doesn't, he's not going to admit it, but he sees this. He sees this, that's why he gives you a scientific explanation. If he didn't say, if he didn't see that everything in the universe is dependent, he wouldn't need to give you a scientific explanation. He wouldn't need to say that the, that the sun, the shining of the sun is caused by nuclear fusion. He'd say that's just the way it is. It's necessary. That's the opposite of dependent. He'd say it's necessary. He'd say the sun shining of the sun is necessary. That's the way it is. Accept it. Don't ask any questions. So if the things in the universe were necessary, then there would be no science because you wouldn't search for an explanation. But things in the universe are all dependent. They're all dependent. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran everywhere. It's on every single page of the Quran. You know, the clearest verses are like, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard wa khtila fi layli wal nahar. You know, verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the changing of the night and the day, there are signs for people who reflect, signs for people who believe. But if you start right from the beginning, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This, this is there. Why? Because Bismillah means with the help of Allah. Why with the help of Allah? Because I'm dependent. When I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, I say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is deserved by Allah. Why is all praise deserved by, what does it mean to praise someone? You praise somebody, you say, nice hat. You say, that this person looks really, you, you look good. You have a beautiful voice. You have a sharp memory. You're praising them. Allah is saying, Alhamdu, all praise is deserved, not by any human being, anything, by Allah. Why? Because Allah is the one who made it that way. Everything else is dependent. So everything in the universe is dependent. There's a technical term for this. I didn't want to scare you, uh, but, I'll, we'll, but we'll, so we'll stick with dependent. So we'll, st we'll, we'll stick with dependent. Everything in the universe is dependent. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. Okay, so let's take uh, some of, I, I used this example this morning. Um, let's take uh, some of my friends. Let's take the Al-Maruk brothers. Please come up to the front. <laughs> Ahmed. And uh, no, no, come. Oh, no, come, come, come. Come, Seth, Seth. Okay. So now, uh, so Seth is standing here. Seth, right? Yeah. Okay. Ahmed is standing here. Owais is standing here. He's the strongest one of the three. So, uh, so uh, Seth is going to fall. Because for some reason, um, he can't stand. Okay, so he can't stand, he can't stand, fall. But it's okay, because Ahmed is there to, to support him. So what we say that Seth is dependent. He's dependent. He needs someone to make him stand. And so he's fortunate that Ahmed is going to help him stand. But Ahmed is also dependent. He needs somebody to make him stand. So he leans back. And <laughs> Owais is going to support the two of them. Okay. But let's say that Owais is also dependent. He needs someone else to make him stand. So there's somebody else behind him. And then there's a line that goes all the way there and it, and it stretches so far that I can't even see the end of it. And all I see is I see a bunch of people leaning on each other. Leaning on each other. 
And uh, I don't know how the, how the line ends. I don't see the end of the line. But at the beginning of the line, I see that uh, my friend Seth, his, he, he's leaning on somebody and he's being supported. He's supported. So what can I conclude? I can't see the end of the line, but what can I conclude? What do you think, Sidi Hasid? What can I conclude? Um, more than that. What can you tell me about the end of the line? At the end of the line, there's someone who's not dependent on someone. Yes. Yes. That's it. Okay. Go ahead. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Demonstration done. Yeah. He said, Sidi Hasib said that at the end of the line, there's someone who's not dependent on anyone. Because if there was no one, if, if that person wasn't there, then everybody would be lying on the ground. Everybody would be lying on the ground. So there, there, this is, so this, what this means is that an unending series of dependencies is impossible. It, 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 it can't, it can't, and this is, this is an illustration. We can take other illustrations as well. And because if the first guy is dependent, he needs someone to fulfill his need. And so he, say, he says to the next guy, hey, help me. And, but that guy is not fulfilling his need. He's just passing the question to, just passing the, the mission to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. If the first guy or any guy is standing, that means that right at the end, there's someone who is, who's not dependent on anyone else. And this example, this is the example of the universe. The universe, everything in the universe is dependent. This is the nature of the universe. Anything that you point at in the universe, it's all dependent. The sun needs something to make it shine. The wind needs something to make it blow. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, the rain needs something to make it fall. Everything is dependent. So when a scientist, what, what he does is, he, he, takes, he takes one dependent thing in the universe, and he says, okay, I need to explain this. And so he, he points to something else. He says, That's, that did it. It was nuclear fusion. But he hasn't, he's, he's given a partial answer. He has not given a full answer. Because that leads you to another question, which is, why is that thing the way that, that it is? And so they, they will search for another explanation for that and they'll give it to you. And the, the, the unending, so this is why the, the, the study of science, it, it, it doesn't end. And that's a good thing. Okay, because we, there are these relations of things in the universe, but if you stay within what science does, it's never going to end. Because science stays within the realm of the universe. And everything in the universe is dependent. But if I look at it and I reflect on this as, a, as, as somebody who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a mind, I reflect on it, I will see that all of these things must be dependent on someone who does not need anything. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's Allah samad, and that's what we mean by al wujud al wajib, necessary being. He is the one. So Allah, and this is this is a very it's a very it's a very profound concept, because it you know he's someone who doesn't need anything, doesn't need anyone to make him the way that he is, and everything in the universe is leaning on him, metaphorically speaking. This is who God is. This is why we worship him. This is why we do sujood to him because we need him. This is why we pray to him because we need him, and our need is intrinsic to us. And this neediness is Tawheed. This is what Tawheed is. This is the message of the Prophet And people, when they looked at the universe, they always saw this. People, so when, 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 the, when in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu samad. In the Qur'an, when Allah says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the Sahaba, what did they say? This is what they saw. They, they, they saw that everything in the universe has to depend on a necessary being who doesn't need anything. Because otherwise nothing makes sense. But then what happened is the scientists came and they confused all of us. <laughs> they, they say it's the other way around. They say that in the, in the beginning, people didn't really know the true cause of things and so they ascribed 
they ascribed, they, they, they ascribed, they said that God is the one who really does everything, but now we really know what's happening. No, they have, it's the other way around. It's the other, people before had it right, but now they, but now there's a reason for this. I'm going to explain to you what the reason is, but, but, but now, so this, the explanation that I gave, I walked you through, through a process to take you out of a mindset that you've been put into because you live in a world that is dominated by materialism. Okay. So what's materialism? Okay. What's, so, so uh, and, and this is, it pervades us. It pervades us and this, this leads to, it leads to questions. It leads, so I, um, uh, so I'll, for, for example, right? So I, I remember um, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I, alhamdulillah, I did well at school when I, when I went to school and I enjoyed science. And so I remember reading the verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says, Alam tara, uh, don't, you, don't you look at the, 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 the birds that fly in the sky and they stretch out their wings and they float and then they, they put them down and then they stretch them out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma yumsikuhunna illa rahman Nobody holds them in the sky except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I remember thinking uh, as a uh, 13, 14 year old, I said, you know, what about Bernoulli's principle? <laughs> you, know, you know, and lift, and where does, where, does, where does all of that fit in? And you know, what, how do I put it together? Why, why was that? It's because of materialism. Materialism, because what, what, so what's materialism? So materialism has a number of different uh, meanings. So it has two meanings. One, one meaning of materialism, somebody who's materialistic means they like material things, they like possessions, they like clothing, they like all of these, uh, they like, like to have a lot of money. They, that's, that's not what I mean over here by materialism. Materialism here is a way of looking at the world. And it's a way, it, materialism is the belief that matter is everything that exists. This is materialism. So what's matter? This is matter. This is matter. This is matter. This is matter. Everything around us is matter. The physical universe, a physical thing that has a place, that has a location, that has weight, that it, all of these things are matter. So if you open up a, science, a physics textbook okay, so if you, and, and, they, and you learn about the universe, and, and we, we learn this, all of our children are learning this, right? So they, they, they learn about the universe and they, they'll define the universe. What's the definition of the universe? Anybody know? What, how, 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 what's the definition of the universe in a, in a standard physics textbook? No? Anybody? The universe, they'll define it as, they'll say the universe is everything that exists. They'll say that everything that, the universe is a name for everything that exists. So you look around, you see the stars, the sun, all of these, this is, and the galaxies, and this is everything that exists. This is, that's, that's false. The universe is not everything that exists. How do I know it's not everything exists? Because it's dependent, and it depends on a necessary being that's not dependent, that's not material. So there's something that exists beyond the universe, and that's God. And God is not a material thing. God is not matter. Matter is needy. Matter is dependent. So, so the, this, this belief in materialism uh, pervades, pervades, our, it, it's, it's pervades our thinking. And it's not, sometimes it's done explicitly, but most of the time it's done implicitly because there's no reference to God. There's no reference to the fact that the, that the, the, the universe needs an ultimate explanation in order for everything to make sense. So, so, uh, so, so this is, uh, so this is, uh, um, okay, so now we can look at, uh, we can look at, um, um, let's look at the atheist who says that, who says that belief that there is no God. Any questions so far? I mean, even modern science, I think they recognize the existence of energy and things like that, right? Those are not material. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was just commenting and trying to have 
see what you could help us understand better about, you know, in modern physics, I mean, they talk about um, energy also existing, and energy is not matter. So what's the relationship of some, I mean, I think even modern science recognizes some non-material things that are part of the earth that yeah. exist so, in the universe somehow. So materialism, there's, there's different names for it. Another name is naturalism. Another name is physicalism. So maybe a better way to say it would be everything is physical. Um, but matter and energy are interchangeable. Right? Energy is just a form of matter and, and vice versa. So, um, so it's the, it's the, the so uh, the, uh, I think physicalism is, is a better, is a better term but it's something that, that we're less familiar with. And so what it means is that physical things are everything that exists. And so we would, we would classify energy as being something physical because it, it, it has a location, it, uh, you know, it, works, it works in the world, in the physical world. So you could put matter and energy kind of together in the same, in the same, in the same box. Um, yeah. So uh, now, uh, I think that's a good point because, uh, because for us, we actually wouldn't, uh, we would actually call it something different. Okay, so I think, I think, what we, I think we would call, material, we wouldn't call it materialism, we would call it something like, uh, we would call it something like dependent, dependent things isn't. That's what we would call it. So it's the belief that only dependent things exist. But, and this is the disconnect. Okay, and that's, that's, what I want, that's what I want to show you. That, so let me, I'll, I'll come back to, to this, this new word in the English language that I've just invented, thanks to Sidi Mounas. Um, the, the, if I, if I, if I, so the uh, materialism, um, so there's this belief amongst, amongst scientists that, that matter is everything that exists. So what a Christian will do, a Christian theist, so you have atheism, atheism is a belief that there's no God, theism is a belief that there is God, but any, it's, this is not an accurate definition because what exactly is meant by God? So what a, what a, what a Christian is going to do is, a Christian doesn't, doesn't Christians are confused. Right? So, uh, you will find that they believe in a necessary being, but they believe that Jesus is God. And Jesus is a dependent thing. Jesus is part of the universe. Jesus is a material thing. So their idea of God is, it's not the same as our idea of God. And so, the, uh, so they, don't, they don't think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that we do. So what they do is, so what the scientist says, scientist says that materialism, everything that exists is material, it's matter, or energy, or uh, space-time, or that's everything that exists, um, and they'll say no, there's something that is beyond matter. So another word for materialism is naturalism, and so they'll, they'll argue for the existence of a supernatural being. What's a supernatural being? A supernatural being is a being that's not natural. A being that's not material, a being that's not physical. So when they, when they, when there's this debate that's happening right now between atheists and Christian believers, the, uh, the this debate is between whether between the existence and non-existence of a supernatural being. What's a supernatural being? A supernatural being is something that's not that's not part of the universe that we can touch and see and feel and detect using our uh, scientific instruments. So they'll use something called, they'll use the argument by design. Okay. So the, the, there's, the, there's something, and I'm sure that, that this is something we're very familiar with, um, argument from design, this idea of intelligent design. So intelligent design, it says that, uh, well, if you look, for example, at the human ear. So the human ear, how does the human ear work? You have, somebody says something, and this is, there's vibrations, vocal cords, they create, uh, 
the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He creates uh, vibrations in the air and these vibrations in the air, they, they come and they go through the outer ear kind of helps them, uh, focuses them and then they go into the middle ear and then they strike the eardrum. Uh, a very, and this eardrum is uh, precisely, is, appears to be made for a, with a purpose. Okay, so, it's, it's, so it's made for a purpose so that when the, when, the, uh, vibra when the vibrations they come, the eardrum moves and then you have three bones, the three small, one of them is the smallest bone in the human body, the hammer, the anvil and something else and they, they, they move, when, when, the, when the eardrum moves, these bones they move and they are placed in a way that they actually magnify the, the vibration. And then they, the last one, it goes in and out of the cochlea, inside which there's a fluid which then moves and it's, the cochlea is like shaped like a snail. And so the vibrations, they travel through the fluid and there's hairs at various places. And so the fluid moves and the hairs move. And depending on the frequency of the sound that you hear and the volume, different areas will move and these vibrations are converted into uh, signals and these signals, they go and they, they go into our brain, then we hear. So you look at this and you say that, well, somebody made this. Somebody with intelligence made this. This was made by somebody who had knowledge, who had will, who had power. There's, there's, there's someone. And so, so this is the argument from, this is intelligent design argument. They'll say that matter, so matter is dead. Matter is dead. Matter is not, you can't make, you can't pray to matter, you can't worship matter. Matter doesn't do anything. Matter doesn't know anything. So, so this is an argument, the intelligent design is an argument against materialism. Materialism is the belief that matter is everything that exists. And intelligent design, it shows that, that matter cannot be everything that exists. Because matter, doesn't have knowledge. Matter cannot design anything. So the conclusion of the argument from intelligent design is the existence of a being that's not material, of a being that is not physical, of a being that's not natural. Right? But the conclusion of this argument is not the existence of a necessary being. That's, it's, it's, it's a, it is a different conclusion. So through I'm, I'm getting a bit excited. I'm not so. <laughs> I'm, 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 I hope I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> so um, please, and anybody, so somebody, some brave man or woman, raise your hand and ask the question that everybody is wishing that you would ask. Yeah. So I'm trying to jump around a little bit. Yeah. You're interdependent. Hello. So I'm going to jump around and go back to one of your basic premise that everything in materials, materialism is dependent on something else. But a lot of scientists talk about circular dependency. So your analogy that you gave of a line, if it's circular, the last person will be supported by the first person. And that's what the whole cosmic theory is based on. Nothing can move from its place because everything is independent of each other. How do you reconcile right. that? So Right, very good. I, I skipped over that. So what, what they say is that when you have a line of dependencies, there's three possibilities. Either you have an unending line, or you have a circular thing, or otherwise it ends at, at, at something that's not dependent. Those are three possibilities. So I showed you why an unending line is impossible. But you also have to, for, for the argument to be complete, you have to show why circular dependencies are also impossible. And that's something we can see. So let's say that I have A, and A is dependent on B, and B is dependent on A. So A has a need. So I need to stand, for example, and so I lean on somebody else. He's going he's to make me stand. But he also needs someone to help him stand, and so he leans on me. So you can, you, like, you can, you can see that circularity doesn't solve the problem of dependencies either. Because if, in order for A to stand, B needs, before A stands, B needs to be standing. But, if, if, uh, but in order for B to stand, A needs to be standing first. So what, what circular dependency, what it is saying is, it's, it's saying a logical contradiction. It's saying that A is standing before B and B is standing before A at the same time, which is impossible. 
So a uh, so circular reasoning and you can you, you can use both of these things in arguments. We use them in arguments, in logical arguments. So if when you when you make a uh, when you when you prove a when you prove a mathematical theory, you say step one, step two, step three. You, it ends at something that mathematicians called axioms, right? So you build a proof from axioms. What are axioms? Axioms are things that don't need to be proved. So if I, for example, I invent a, a mathematical theorem, and I say I say uh, and and uh, and I say I'm going to prove it to you, and so you say, what's your proof? I say, well, here's a, here's another one. And then you say, OK, well, what's the proof of that? I say, here's another one. And you say, what's the proof of that? I say, here's another one. And then I, I do one of two things. Either I say, don't worry, I'll save you time. We'll be here for an infinite amount of time. No matter, whenever you ask me, I'm going to pull, pull another one out of my pocket. You're going to say, I haven't proven anything, because I need an axiom to prove something. Similarly, if I, if I say that I, I have this conclusion, prove it to me. You say, well, it's because of this. And prove it to me, and you say it's because of that. This is also a logical fallacy. Okay? It's called begging the question. The, the, uh, the, you, you, your, uh, you have to the uh, the conclusion. Need, you can't, you can't embed, you can't embed the conclusion into the into the premises. So similarly, uh, a circular circular dependency is not an. Uh, it doesn't explain the dependency. So it has to be. There has to be a. Be there has to be something that is independent. Otherwise, the existence of dependent things would be impossible. Um, so uh, so that's that's an explanation. And um, but scientists, you're right. Scientists do say that. And scientists also say that infinite an infinite chain of dependencies is possible. And scientists also say that they'll disagree with this thing of dependency. And scientists also, so there's what I'm presenting, there's, there's many, many scientists who, dis, who, will, who will dispute many things that I'm saying. But, but, but they're mistaken. And, and we, can, we can look at those things, and one could look at those things, so, but I, what I want to, the point that I want to convey is that in order for us to really have belief, we have to evaluate things critically. And that means that, that, so that means that there might be a physicist who's a graduate of Stanford University who has a position on circular dependence, but I have the, I have the clarity and the confidence to say that yes, you graduated from Stanford, but I can see that this is wrong. And, and, and it is, it is like that. So what, what you, so I'm, I'm just kind of describing it to you, but but inshallah, I hope that uh, I, I'd love to talk to you more about this as well. But uh, this is something that I've seen. So I've, in the beginning, you you kind of you kind of hesitant. But I've so I've personally talked to people and I've I, I've tested things out and I've and so I've I, this is the conclusion that I, I have absolute certainty in. Like there there's these are basic truths that that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us a mind and we can see. And people with large, uh, they use, they use uh, big words and big equations. And th there's a, an area where they're doing their job, but in another area, they're just kind of covering up, uh, they're covering up falsehood with gobbledygook. Yeah. Can you give an example of circular reasoning that, that yeah. people are falling for or using? Yeah. Um, what the people are falling for, that, that, um, that might be a little bit, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. If somebody has someone, you can help me. But if I, an example of circular reasoning is that, uh, is that, um, so the classical example they use is uh, with Christians, they say that, uh, uh, is that, uh, They'll say it's to do with the, uh, with the Bible and God. So they'll say, how do you know that the Bible, how do you know that God exists? Because the Bible said so. How do you know that, uh, how, how do you know that, uh, how do you know that the Bible is true? Because God revealed it, right? So here, this is, you can't, it doesn't work. You know, you have to, you have to, so you have to actually, that this is why, so we don't do that. So we, our reason, so this is, uh, our reason for believing in God is not because the Quran says so. 
But in fact, the Quran, it teaches us to use our minds to see that God exists. And then we see that this is the word of God. Um, okay, so anything else? Did you guys um, get this idea of supernatural being? Oh, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was just going to say that I think you just mentioned that a lot of Christians say that how do you know that the Bible is true because God said that you know the Bible is true. How do you know that it was sent by God? Uh, how do you, or whatever, I'm confusing myself. But, but, but I think everybody got the idea of how that's circular. Um, but I, I, that's pretty standard Muslim thing from what I've seen. I, you know, I think very common in the Muslim community to just, you know, uh, you can read Bin Baz fatwas about, you know, uh, how the way we know that Allah exists is because Qul hu Allahu ahad as a, as, a, as, a, as a surah. I'm not meaning that to challenge what you're saying is wrong, just giving you an opportunity maybe to address that if you think it's something worth addressing. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so uh, that's a mistake. I mean, so that's so there are there are many uh, many Muslims who say many things, but they're uh, but they're mistakes. So that's a mistake, and many and, and many and uh, but uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. Okay, so tell me the difference. Let me just come come back here. Tell me the difference between a supernatural and necessary being. So are the are the Young men and women following, or are they kind of? What's the what's the difference between between a supernatural and a necessary being? Yeah. Is um someone that can do things that normal humans can't, such as like fly. Like right. I don't think anyone in this room can fly, so. Um, and a normal human being is someone such as you and me. Um, good. So a supernatural, a, so you say, so, so that's, this is important. So what he, what he says, uh, what, what's your name? Shamil. Pardon me? Shamil. Shamil. Uh, Shamil, mashallah. Imam Shamil. So, so the, so the, idea of supernatural is then, so an atheist like, um, like Richard Dawkins or, or, or Sam Harris, what, they would, what they'll say is they'll go, they're going to equate belief in God to belief in fairies. Why do they do it? This is why they do it. It's because of, because of, because of what, what Chanel just said. Because they'll say that fairies are supernatural they're, they don't belong to the material world that we can touch and observe and and uh, and and uh, and uh, and reason about using scientific instruments. And God is something that we cannot uh, touch and observe and reason about using scientific instruments. And so they're both supernatural things. That's why belief in God is, is like belief in fairies. And, and they'll say, and they'll, they'll, like, they'll kind of, you know, make fun of religious people, and they'll say that, that uh, you know, they, they believe in, it's like believing in fairies. So this is where they're coming from. Okay? So now, in order, to, in order to understand where the, so, so this, is, this happens because of, because they have a particular idea of God. They have idea of God as a supernatural being. But God is not not just a supernatural being, God is a necessary being. So there's a difference between fairies and God. The difference between fairies and God is, fairies, even if they might be supernatural, they are dependent. Because if you think of a fairy, then something would need to make it the way that it is. Just give it the form that it has, um, give it the ability to fly, to do all of the things that it does, but God is not dependent. God doesn't depend on anything. So yes, fairies and God are both supernatural, but God is a necessary being. 
Fairies are not necessary beings. And I know that God exists because the universe is dependent and it points to the existence of a necessary being. But I have no, exist I have no evidence for the existence of fairies. So uh, I do have evidence for the existence of angels and jinn, but that's a different, it's going to take us onto a different topic. I'm going to put that to a side for now. Uh, but what fairies, we don't have any evidence for the existence of fairies, but we do have evidence for the existence of God, and that's what we began with. So the, the supernatural, the world of the supernatural, it falls, you can divide it into two categories. Something that's supernatural could be dependent, or it could be necessary. So when, when a, this, this discussion that happens between, uh, between Christians and atheists, it's, it's in the realm of, they're, they're arguing about supernatural beings, materialism, intelligent design, going back and forth. Um, so here's another, here's another question that comes from here. So what they'll say is, uh, there's, uh, you, know, you use intelligent design to prove the existence of a, of, of a, of a supernatural being. And so a common, a common question that people will say, they'll say, who designed the designer? They'll say that, 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 that if you need God, because he's the one who designed the universe, then who designed God? So that's an objection that they put, they put forth against the argument of God for the existence of God from intelligent design. So what's the answer to that? Where, where, where did they go wrong? Where is the miscommunication? One of the ladies can... One of the girls? <laughs> this is like the chain of dependencies. <laughs> it has to end somewhere. Can you repeat your question? Yeah, um, so the... Uh, the um, okay, so the question is... Okay. Um, who designed God? I think I, someone mentioned... Or... So the, the idea goes like this. So a Christian will say to a materialist, materialist says that matter is everything that exists, there's no God. Christian will say no. If you look at design in the universe, it points to the existence of something that's not material. Because it points to the existence of someone who's intelligent. Someone, because, it, because it's someone who designed things. So they'll say that, well, okay, then if you need somebody to design the universe, then you haven't answered the question because then who designed the designer? So you haven't, you haven't, you haven't solved the problem, just created another problem. Well, I think the questioner is wrong in that they're failing to recognize that what makes God, God, is the fact that he's the one underlying an infinite reason and he is the ultimate cause, he does not need a cause. Yes, so. yes. So, 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 what, what, so they're, they're viewing God as a dependent being that is that the supernatural dependent being. But that's not what we mean by God. So the question, if you, if you conceive of God as someone who doesn't need anything and the one who is needed by everyone, then, then this question doesn't come. This question doesn't arise. So when I, when I prove the existence of a necessary being, then, you know, and actually this question is actually coming from the fact that they don't, that there's a lack of understanding that God doesn't need anything. That's why the argument, the, in, the design argument, it actually, so if you, want to be, if you want to be precise, the argument from design doesn't prove the existence of God. The argument from design disproves materialism. And, and, but, but God, the argument for the existence of God is this, is what I've just described. And this is what Muslims have been using for centuries. And it's there in the Quran. This is, what, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the universe. He reminds us that we're dependent on Him. This is why Sayyidina Ibrahim says that He is the one who feeds me. He is the one who, who, who gives me, who, when I, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ and he gives me to drink and he takes care of me. And where, is, where are all of these things coming from? They're coming from the fact that we're dependent and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fulfilling all of our needs. He's the being who fulfills all of those needs. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, yeah. 
So that's what I, that's actually what I, that's all that I had to say, share with you. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, or comments on anything you want to follow up on. Assalamu uh, You discussed how atheists are able to use the flaw in Christian reasoning because of uh, the Christian confusion about Jesus and, and how Jesus is dependent. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you could discuss also how atheism um, attracts or uh, how it utilizes confusion in the Jewish community. Um, in the Jewish, Jewish theology isn't my expertise, so I haven't, uh, I haven't, I, uh, what I, what I, I've, uh, I only know it as a distance, so I've worked with many Christians, but, uh, not okay, sure. Can, can I ask a second question then? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, which was just, um, I think you've defined all the terms on the board except for possibly science? Yes, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's the conclusion. Let's define science. Excellent. <laughs> so what's the definition of science? So in light of that, so this, that's how I wanted to conclude things. Because, because um, an atheist is going to define science in a way that supports his worldview. And a Christian is going to try and define it in a way that prevents that worldview from coming into being. And we as Muslims, in light of the fact that everything is ultimately dependent on God, we're going to define it some other way. So, but it's, it's an ambiguous term and there's books that are written about it, what, what is science, and people have argued and, there's, and uh, philosophers of science are not going to give you any conclusive answer. But as, as a Muslim, as a Muslim, how would we, uh, what would we, how would we, uh, so I looked, I looked this up, I, I did, you know, I tell my students, don't use Google, but then when they're not looking, I do it myself. Uh, so, uh, so if you look it up on Google, they'll point you to the Oxford English Dictionary. I see many of you are doing the same thing on your phones. <laughs> so it says, I have here an intelligent and practic an intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of physical of the physical world through observation and experiment. Um, and you'll find many other things that, uh, so I, I did a quick survey. So there's a number of things that are, that are unique to science. So one of the things is that it studies the, so it studies the physical world. So it's the study of the physical world. So this is part of the definition of science. Another part of the definition of science is that it studies the physical world through a particular method and that method is it involves observation and experiment. So we, so that's, that's, that's something that you, that you will see but what I would say is from a Muslim perspective in the light of the existence of God as a necessary being, um, what I want to put in here is that it studies, I want to, I want to put science within my worldview. So I want to, I have a, I, I look at the universe and I see that everything is dependent on God and in light of this, when I am studying the physical world through observation and experiment, what am I discovering? What is it that I'm discovering? So, uh, so in other words, I, the belief in the existence of God precedes science. I can see that God exists before I do science and now I want to put the activity of science into my worldview. So what I'm going to say is that science studies relations between the dependent things in the universe. So when I, I, I there's a relation between 
uh, between the uh, between a large amount of hydrogen gathering together and the relation is that when that happens then it gets pushed together and it turns into helium and it releases energy and that's the shining, uh, shining of the stars as an example and every, every, everything that you learn in science you can actually look at it in this way that what I'm doing is through science, through the scientific method I'm studying, I'm studying so instead of saying the physical world I'm going to say it's the dependent, the dependent things in the universe because when, when, when people say, when, when in science, when they talk about the physical world and there's an underlying idea that that's everything that exists, it creates a false perception of reality. So I'm going to say it's the study of the relations between the dependent things in the universe. That's what, that's what science tells me. It tells me that when, uh, when I, through observation and experiment and modeling and the other methods of modern science, which are all, which are all great, you know, so we love science, science is great it, and there's so many blessings that we have because of, because of science and, but what is it doing? What it's doing, it's, 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 it's helping us understand the relations between the dependent things in the universe and then we use those relations to our advantage. So we, we make a cell phone, we make, you know, carpets, buildings, planes, um, so, uh, but, but that's not what an atheist would say. Because to an atheist, he doesn't look at things in the universe as dependent. He's going to give a different definition to, uh, to science. That's why he's going to say that science supports an atheistic worldview. Um, and a Christian might give a different definition. Uh, but that's, this is what we would say. Does that make sense? Yes, please. So, I mean, I just wonder if that, uh, if there's still a gap there though, because these are the usual ways that dependent things relate to each other if Alice Wandela wants them to relate to each other that way, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You put that in, and now miracles are possible. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So can you also talk about suffering and why there's suffering? I think atheists will often use the you know, the, the reason of like, if God exists, why would there be suffering? Okay, good. So now, uh, now, so what I, so there's, there's a logical answer and there's an emotional answer, right? So the, I'm going to give the logical answer first. And this logical answer, it makes sense when you think about it, but it kind of doesn't make you feel very good. And so then I'll, I'll help you feel good afterwards. So, just, so first, first just, let's just look at the logic of it. So if you look at the logic of it, so we start with, uh, we, start, we start everything with definitions. So suffering, let's, let's define suffering. Yes, so let's, let's define suffering. Um, so suffering, let's, so how do, you, how do you make a definition? You first you take examples and then from that you, you make a definition. So let's take suffering. Suffering is like, uh, yeah, somebody's going to say something? Like what? Like dying. Dying is suffering. Um, uh, feeling pain is suffering. Grief and misery is suffering. Torture is suffering. Uh, and so these are, these are examples of suffering. So if I look at all of these things, I say that, uh, okay, death, you know, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's interesting that you said that, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Mumit. He's Al-Muhi and he is Al-Mumit. And that's, that's, very, um, that's, uh, that's very interesting, it's, it's very relevant because death is a, is, a, um, is a dependent, I was going to say the technical term. So the technical term for dependency is contingency. Uh, uh, but I'm just going to stick to this dependent. So the death is something that's dependent. 
It's meaning that when somebody dies, you need, it needs to have been, somebody needs to have made you die. And so, who is it that really makes you die? Well, the one who really does everything in the universe. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-mumit. So this is very, it's very interesting because what it's telling us is that something that is, that we see as suffering is in reality a dependent phenomenon that proves the existence of God, doesn't disprove it. All of the suffering that we, that we experience, it needs someone to make it exist. It's, there's no, there's no, it's, there's, it's just as pleasure is something that's dependent and suffering is also something that's dependent. So suffering from a logical perspective is an argument for the existence of God. It's not an argument against the existence of God. It's an argument for the existence of God as a necessary being. So why does an atheist say that suffering is an argument against the existence of God? Because he has a certain idea of God in his mind. He's, the, he's not thinking about God as a necessary being. He's thinking about God in a different way. Okay, so uh, so let's, let's put the way that he thinks about it aside for a moment. So, but this is the logical answer. This is the, the logical answer is that when, I, when something bad happens to me, when something unpleasant happens to me, I know that this, that this is it's coming from God. So now, but that, but that, that's the logical answer. The emotional answer is why, you know? Why me? Why, why not, you know, uh, or why a little child? Or why, why, uh, you know, why somebody, why, you know, why, why, why? And so that, these why questions, so this is a, why did God do something? Why? Okay. What does why mean? And so, what does it mean when we say why? So let's say that I uh, that uh, I uh, I get uh, you know I uh, I ground my son from doing something because he didn't make his bed. So he didn't make his bed. So I grounded him. He says why? I said because you didn't make your bed. Okay, so this is this is this is a reason. This is this is an, this is a reason that's being given for why I'm doing a particular action. So now if you think about this for a second. Why did I do this? I did this because I wanted my son to make his bed. It's a bad example. I never made my bed, and I still have trouble making my bed. And my mother was very nice to me. So, um, but, uh, so I've, uh, so, but let's take a hypothetical somebody who, who, who does that. So th they, um, they, uh, they, they have a goal that they want to reach. I want to teach my son to make his bed. And so in order to do that, I'm going to ground my son. So uh, I should do positive things before that. This is a terrible example. <laughs> but I'm stuck with it. So just if we, if we, so this is, so what I have is I'm doing this because I need this in order to achieve a certain goal. Right, so when I, when you ask about a human being, why did a human being do something? You're saying, what goal are you trying to achieve by doing this action? What goal are you trying to achieve? So when I put on a coat, why am I putting on a coat? Because I want to get warm. And when I put on a coat, I'm going to get warm. If I, if I, uh, if I work out, I'm doing it so that I can get healthy. I want to get healthy, and so I'm working out so that I can get healthy. I do something so that I can achieve something else. Well now if you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't need anything, right? So this, this why question in this sense is asked about human beings because human beings have needs that they need to fulfill. So we call this a motive. So a motive, motive, motive is, some, is from motor, something that moves you. So we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, does not have motives. God does not have motives. So we have motives. God does not have motives. What moves me to do something? Um, I am moved to do something by, because of a need that, I need, that I need that needs to be fulfilled. Allah doesn't need anything. He doesn't have any motives. So the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
they are they don't they don't have they don't have any motives and so does it mean so when we ask a why question about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has to have a different meaning has a different meaning what's the what meaning does it have so the meaning when we ask why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this uh, the meaning is we, we ask about it's about wisdom the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a difference between wisdom and motive so wisdom is a is some kind of a benefit that comes about as a result of something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything that he does even if it appears unpleasant something we don't understand um, there is some benefit that's going to come out of it for someone as a result of that and we believe in that that's what it means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be wise so when we ask why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example there is somebody has a child and their child gets sick and they die so when we say why did Allah do that we say what's the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing it and there are some of the wisdoms we understand, some, some we don't understand. So one of the wisdoms is to, so that, uh, to, so that a, a parent can show um, their slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a, um, I have a, uh, there's an, uh, a, a man who I, I, I believe, he's, he's an old man, and he appears, um, I believe him to be a righteous man. Um, a Syrian man and I um, had the good fortune of meeting him while I was in Jordan and he has a, a large family and he had a, and his oldest son and so his oldest son he used to depend on him he died in an accident and he was brought in and he died in the house in front of everybody and the the daughters their friends with my wife they told they told her the story how that when that happened uh, this man he he had a smile on his face and he said, Allah, I'm pleased with whatever you've given me. And you, and, you, uh, and you gave him to me and you've taken him away. And everybody is crying and he had this look of pleasure and he washed the body and he shrouded it and he buried it. And that was something that the children never forgot. They remembered it for the rest of their lives. So what happened here is that this is, we say that this was the wisdom behind this tragic event. What's the wisdom? Wisdom is a benefit that comes about as a result of it that's not a motive. And it's something we understand uh, through the perspective of servanthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every unpleasant thing, there's some wisdom. There's something, there's some good that comes about as a result of it. Um, and uh, you know, there's benefit in the, in the akhirah. Um, uh, there's reward for patience. So, uh, so that's the answer to the why question. And, uh, and the reason why atheists, they, they, think, uh, they think that it disproves the existence of God is because they limit the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't, they don't see that everything in the universe is dependent on God. And so they limit the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that it's not within the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause suffering to other people. And because they have this imagination, it leads them to this, uh, to this conclusion that suffering means that God does not exist, but that's false. And we believe in the hellfire. So if we believe in the hellfire, you believe in suffering. And it's part of our, so it's part of, so suffering, it reveals the majesty and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, something back there, yeah? Assalamu alaikum. Um, just a comment, really. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I've been having this conversation with my neighbor. He's actually a nuclear scientist. so. Me and him are always going back and forth. Um, I would just say that uh, science actually doesn't have the, it doesn't facilitate the, the, the mechanisms or it doesn't have the tools to understand the supernatural world. I mean, it understands the natural world because it can measure um, and sounds, you know, touch, etc. It can measure the natural world, but it hasn't got the, the, the tools to measure, for example, angels or the unseen. So in that sense, you know, there, there isn't, it's almost an oxymoron. You can't, you can't expect science to understand um, to the point where you have faith, right? So you have, to, you have to kind of come to them in terms of like, what, what do they believe in? And do they understand that there is actually a higher purpose beyond just measuring uh, the universe? I just wanted to add that. Um, okay. 
You mind if I, if I comment on that? Yeah, yeah please. Okay. So the, uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's truth to that, but that's also, that's also a, that's also a Christian argument. That's a response to atheists. Um, and there is, there's some, there's some areas that are, uh, that we need to think carefully about. So first of all, when we, when we believe in angels, so I th the key thing is that our, our religion is an evidence-based religion. So when the Prophet wasallam he came, there's not a single verse in the Quran that tells us not to use our reason. And there's dozens of verses that condemn people for not using their minds. And, and, uh, and, Allah subhanahu, and the, the, the standard argument of the idolaters of, of Mecca was that we're just doing this because our forefathers did this. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if they didn't think, even if they're not guided, even if they're not. So, right, but uh, how do you measure God? How do you measure an angel? How do you measure? You can't, you can't measure any, not, no, there's no scientific instrument that's, that's created. That's right. I agree right, with so you. That's, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you there. But, 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 so, so I was going to say, what you said is correct, but the, but I, let me just, I'll describe to you, I'll, let me describe to you how this argument happens between Christians and atheists, right? So the, so the, so the, the way that it happens between Christian and atheists, an atheist says that, uh, that I, science doesn't, doesn't, science doesn't prove God. I just and so the Christian just, says. Just one caveat, I, uh, when, I, when I spoke to this uh, person, um, I fully aware, I was fully aware that, you know, if we, obviously Islam, Islam uh, actually, uh, enforces us to learn and understand our environment and everything around us. We have no uh, problem with science, actually. Right. That's, that, that's not the issue. The, the issue is that they don't understand beyond measurement. They cannot yeah. understand. Um, you can't, you can't uh, measure the supernatural world. It's, right. it's, just, it's, it's an oxymoron. Yeah, you're right. I agree with that's you. That's really just my yeah. comment. So yeah. I, and I'm not, I'm not, I just, I'm just taking your, oppor your yeah. comment as an opportunity to make another general comment. So that, that I think is useful for us to understand so without it being directed against, against what, what you said. So I, what you said is correct. Right? I agree with it. <laughs> so, but the way that between, between Christians and, 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 uh, and atheists, the way that the argument goes is that the, the atheist will say that, um, you, that science doesn't, doesn't prove God. And the Christian will say that, well, the Christian will say to an atheist, you can't disprove the existence of God. And so since you can't disprove the existence of God, you haven't harmed my, my, uh, my position. Because I'm going to believe in it, you can't disprove what I say. So the, a, Christian, a Christian belief, it's based on faith. Faith means um, the choice to believe even when there's no evidence to support it, as long as there's no evidence to go against it. And actually, they believe in things and there's evidence to go against it as well. So, but what I want, so the, the, this idea, so what, what they say is, what the Christians will say is that, they'll say that, uh, they'll say, so, and, and a scientist will come, and then the Christian will say that, uh, that, well, you do your science, science is here, religion is here, science does its thing, it can't understand God, it can't disprove God, I'm fine. Then, uh, so that is, that's, that's true, but, it creates problems. So what, what will the atheist say? The atheist will say that, well, um, fairies are the same way. Uh, m uh, that science can't measure fairies, and, uh, and that's, also w without, w without, uh, that's also outside the realm of science, so belief in God is like belief in fairies. And so the religious people are stupid people, and they believe in fairies. So, so, so we want to, we want, when we, when we use our, so it's what we have to be, so we have to understand the, that the back and forth that happens between uh, Christians and atheists, we have our own unique positions. And so, so there's sometimes we look, at, we, look, we look at a Christian theist and he says something and, it, and we latch onto it, not realizing that we are thereby exposing ourselves to being critiqued by, by, by atheists in a way that we don't need to be critiqued. So, so what we so uh, so what we would say is that our belief in everything is based on evidence. So I don't believe in fairies, but I believe in jinn and angels. And the reason why I believe in jinn and angels is because God exists. 
Um, he sent the Prophet Muhammad, who's the final messenger, and I can prove to you that he's the final messenger. And he told me that, that, uh, that, that there's these things such as jinn and, uh, and angels. And that's why I believe in it, and I have evidence for it. As for fairies, I don't believe in fairies. So, so uh, and, uh, and, and they could exist, but I don't, I don't believe in them because uh, I don't have any evidence to, uh, to believe in them. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to say to this person? Who's, uh, sorry. When so you say I'm, that he, if you say, okay, I believe in angels and jinns, yeah. and I have, I have evidence for it. Yeah. So what are you going to say to this person who I'm, doesn't, he doesn't know how to measure a jinn or doesn't know how to measure an angel? How, so what are you going to say to this person? I'm going to say to this person that, uh, that, let's, uh, that in order for you to understand my evidence, first, you have to, you, have to uh, you need to believe in the existence of God as a necessary being. I'm going to show that to you. After, and so, and I have to get that down first. If that's not down, then I can't go to the next step. After I do that, then I say, okay, now, next step. Next step is, I'm going to show you that God, this necessary being, sent a messenger to humanity, Muhammad, and he is a genuine messenger of God. And I'll show you why that's true. And so now, and now, do you see that? I see that, okay, now, I have another evidence-based source of knowledge apart from science, through which I can learn about things that exist. So, but, so the problem with this guy is, he's, he, he, he doesn't see that, so that's why you're right. You're right that science doesn't tell you, t tell you everything. And that's, that's, that's a good observation. But this other thing, but the, 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 but the reason why we believe in other things is because we have another line of evidence outside of science that tells us about that. So science is a source of knowledge, Revelation is a source of knowledge and, and there's kinds of reasoning that are non-scientific kinds of reasoning that are also sources of knowledge. So we need to integrate everything together. I mean, just one last thing I want to say that uh, one of the things that's kind of bamboozled him is, um, I kind of mentioned to him, you know, what's the existence, is there an ex existence of nothingness? You know, do you understand what nothingness means? And he does not understand how to square that in his perspective. So in that sense, you can use their arguments against them. You don't actually need to even use Islam because they, they can actually be bamboozled by their own arguments because they're very limited. They don't have the capability to understand beyond, you know, their... But then you haven't taken them anywhere. Right, but, but the thing is, like you said, I, I would start with, like, explaining them about God and then, obviously, from there, you'd actually tell them about the, the mechanisms of how God works in, and how he manifests his attributes. And, you know, from there on, you, you, you can explain to them, like, you know, this is how uh, you measure those attributes that we see in a slightly different perspective, much more grounded perspective. So, um, I totally understand what you're saying, and I yeah. totally agree. I think we're just kind of yeah, on the same I, page. I, I totally agree with you, too. You know? <laughs> I just wanted to say something. Yeah. Like, let's just say we know for sure there is a God, and atheists are wrong, but... Then we have the problem is, well, who's right, the Christians or the Muslims, right? And um, I just wanted to say that, uh, make one point, that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to fix the mistakes and errors that are in the, the Bible. Right. And um, if, as you know, if you're a Muslim, you believe that um, you have this concept of tahrif, where the Bible was... Uh, it changed and corrupted and everything and is basically um, made by, inspired by religion but not written by any prophet or written by God or not the exact word of God like the Quran is and you, you could use scientists this is where the scientists and the Christians tend to argue is that uh, science disproves the Bible like in Genesis when it says in the Bible that the God created the world in six days and he created Adam and Eve on earth and within those six days and he created the birds and the fish and all the animals and if this is a contradiction to science but it's not a contradiction to Islam because it doesn't say anywhere in the Quran that the earth was created within six days it talks about Allah's throne being created within six days but um, Allah created Adam and Eve in, in Firdaus um, in, at one point in, the, in, the, in Earth's creation, but not at the beginning of Earth's creation, 
because if you study Islam, you'd know that the jinn and a lot of animals, possibly dinosaurs, have been living on earth for a really long time. Uh, in the hadith, it talks about the jinn tormenting the animals and the jinn going to war with each other for s such a long time that uh, eventually Allah created Adam and Eve as a as a substitute for the jinn or, the, or and put, put Adam and Eve onto this earth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, so the Quran was there to fix the scientific mistakes of the Bible and we don't need the Bible, we just have the Quran because um, the Quran um, was the word of God and sent there to fix the mistakes like the time it said in the Quran that Jesus was not crucified, nor was he killed. And um, why, would it, why would it say this if it's a contradiction of, of the gospel? But the gospel is a contradiction of itself and the contradiction of science. Right. The only thing I would add to that is that this argument does disprove Christianity because Christians don't believe in God in this way. So this actually does show that, uh, that Christianity is, uh, is, uh, but is false. Ladies, yeah. Um, so for our youth, would you recommend um, basically, especially like younger children as they get older, explaining to them um, at an early age that definition of science? Because yeah. it yeah. seems to me that that is such a direct way of getting them to, yeah. Yeah. to disassociate from trying to understand God from a scientific view and instead knowing that science has its place in terms of a relation of dependent things and God is its own entity. Um, but Ab just absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So that's, yeah, and that actually, that's actually what I, um, that's, that's, my, that's my project, that's what I'm doing. I have a, is, uh, so um, I, I think that all of our children concurrently with their, with their uh, mainstream uh, school education, they need, they need to have a parallel um, Islamic education that understands what they're learning and helps them put it into their Islamic worldview and from an early age, before it becomes a problem, right? And so, uh, so it needs to happen, this, this, so something like this, um, any, so when they're, you know, by the time they, they're, they're entering high school, they should, they should understand this, right? Because it's out there, you know, it's part of our preparing. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sidi. Jazakum Allah khair. Thank you for the wonderful dars. I just had a question on the, if you can please comment on the scientists, because it seems like there's a, a big struggle between theism and science. And, uh, but as you uh, go into science, that it seems like there are, it has become a religion almost. Science, you know, scientists, they get so dogmatic. So it's not just pursuit of uh, study of physical and world uh, with observation experiment. They t tend to also have certain belief systems which are basically, uh, without any proof and argument, they just, they'll believe something. Just like we mentioned circular reasoning, it does not have any logic, but that was, those are the kind of things they will use to uh, promote scientism. And uh, so science is almost like a religion. People are very passionate about it without really understanding the logic or the rational behind it. So how do you deal with those kind of people? So, um, so I've, um, um, I uh, thought about this a lot. I read a lot of books and uh, on what various Muslims have to say about this and also non-Muslims. And I think the conclusion I came to is that the only problem with science is materialism. So, so you'll find, um, you'll find, for example, there's a book called The God Delusion by Rupert Sheldrake. It's an excellent book. And it talks about the 10 myths of science, 10, uh, 10 unproven assumptions that science uses. And he, he's a scientist. He's actually a very, um, very uh, intelligent, insightful scientist. And uh, he critiques it from a scientific perspective. And he'll say things like, uh, the conservation of mass and energy is something, is an unproven assumption. 
Um, and he'll take some other, he has other examples as well. And there's other scientists who do that, who say similar things. But I think that the issue is really simple. The, si the only issue, the only issue with science is its materialism. If you, if you take away materialism, which is the belief that everything that exists is physical, and you put it into, into the perspective of that science is the usual relations between the dependent things in the universe, and you put it into the context, then do all the science you want. Because this is, this is what it's telling you. And uh, so we have to be, I think, we have to be careful. And this goes to what our, the last comment that we had recently from the brother here, that, that uh, we don't have, we don't have the, all of the contradictions with science that a Christian does. And it's a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so, so we can, we can, we can, uh, so we, if, we, if we just remove materialism from it, and then we have a critical look, which means you actually, you, you do good science. Good science means good evidence-based reasoning. So you actually, you, you look at a conclusion, and you see why it's the case. And that's, some, that's also something that's missing in, uh, in a lot of science education. They tell you that this is, they tell you facts. You can, and then you believe it as a religion. And, but, but we don't, uh, uh, so um, I think part of our uh, education needs to be like, you know, how does a scientist think and, and why, why, why does he say, you know, what's the evidence for this and what's the evidence for that? And then be like an intelligent, informed, uh, uh, yeah. But the, only, the, the materialism is the only issue. I don't, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. Uh, no. You, you mentioned the God delusion, but it's the science delusion by Rupert Science Aldrich. delusion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Science delusion. God delusion. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. So I just wanted to make uh, two comments. So one is about that question about suffering. Uh, why is there suffering? So, I mean, this is, the fact that there is suffering does not disprove that there is a God. Right. So very clearly, I mean, one way to make it kind of clear to so somebody asking that question is, okay, if you say, uh, uh, if there is a God, then there should be no suffering. So let's take, let's take some practical examples. There's a worker, he's working on a skyscraper and he's trying to tighten something and then his leg slipped. So he's going to fall down and break his head. So what do you want God to do? Send a mattress from the sky, a flying carpet to just come under his, uh, and catch him or something like that? So if that happens, is that what you're expecting God to be doing? I mean, some scientists or engineers in Boeing they developed the 737 and they made some mistakes, whatever they did. Now the plane is uh, crashing. You want God to just send a balloon and just envelop that plane as it's about to crash and just protect everybody? I mean, so this is why it's not a scientific evidence because science is about cause and effect. So look at the coronavirus that's around right now. People are suffering, people are dying. So scientists know that there's a virus See, that's a virus that affects people, people are going to get diseased, people are going to die. So, the fact that there is a, there's suffering is not necessarily, I mean, disproving that God exists. So, uh, if, you want God, if you say God has to intervene every time, so there's an earthquake, for example, and a house collapses, and you're saying, oh, God should save all the babies there, and because babies should, be, I mean, it's a bad thing for babies to suffer. I mean, by the time you present the people that way, I think it becomes very clear to them that this does not disprove God. These are some natural laws in nature. And to your point earlier that the fact that it looks like suffering does not necessarily mean it's actually suffering. So if you save the babies, then what happens? Then the babies don't die. You have earthquake and all the babies are just crawling around after an earthquake. I mean, so is that, is that what we expect? And then the second point I wanted to make is about the issue of circular arguments. I think the brother here mentioned it also, that on, for the Quran, so we, we have a lot of proofs and evidences that this is, this is from God. And this is just beyond this world. This is beyond what a human being can just come up and, and make up. So it's not just a question of, oh, we believe in the Quran and the Quran says there's God and it's that circular. No. For the Quran itself, is it the balaga of the Quran, the, the preservation of the Quran, the, 
the, I mean, the laws, the finance, justice, everything. There's a lot of things you can use to even prove that the Quran is, I mean, the word of God itself. So, Thank you. I have a question about evolution and Darwinism, and I know that there's a lot of children in this audience, and can you explain evolution and uh, Darwinism and what the Islamic perspective is on that? Okay, um, okay. yes. Um, so, the, so I'm gonna explain it, and, um, and okay. So uh, what is evolution? So what's the theory of evolution? The theory of evolution basically is that um, we observe uh, slight differences um, in various, um, in uh, different life forms, different animals, and, um, and we have a fossil record, and we can go back, and, uh, and we can see that, that in previous times, life forms were simpler. Uh, you can, there's certain distributions of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of properties, and so uh, animals in Australia, they look the same as animals elsewhere, except that many of them, they have certain specific Australian uh, properties, such as pouches, marsupials, um, and that's attributed, that could be attributed to continental shift and different, different kinds of animals being breeding and then, and then different traits propagating. Um, uh, there are, uh, you know, you look at a whale, uh, you look at a whale, and a whale is a mammal. Sorry, higher. So a whale, a whale is a mammal, and a whale doesn't behave like a fish, doesn't function like a fish, like a regular fish. And if you look at the fins of the whale, and you look at the skeleton of the whale inside the fins, it looks like fingers. So if you look at it, it looks like it used to be a land animal, and then it evolved and it became a whale. So there's many lines of reasoning for, for, uh, for the theory of evolution. So the theory of evolution is problematic for uh, Christians um, because, as the brother here, he mentioned, that uh, there are, there's a very specific description of how the universe was made in the beginning of the Bible. So the, there's, there's verses of the Bible that say that particular animals, many different kinds of animals, were made the way that they were right from the beginning. So, uh, so uh, and they, they also specify an age to the universe. So there's a group of Christians, they're called young earth creationists. They believe the universe is, I think, 6,000 years old. Um, and, uh, and every animal was created the way that it is. Um, and so the, there's a debate that happens between these people and between the uh, atheists who believe in the theory of evolution. And so evolution has become, has turned into the uh, into a into a thing that if you it's the mark it's the mark of an enlightened scientific person that they believe in evolution and it's the mark of somebody who is close-minded and not open to evidence that they don't believe in evolution and they believe in God and they have all of these other contradictory beliefs with them so the reason why I'm saying that is because this, this is the background behind the debate so and we need to understand this before we go in because just as over here, we, we, we don't want to just put ourselves in a particular camp. We have, we have our own position. So what our, uh, what our position is, is that, uh, that Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, he says, um, in the uh, Isa in Allahi kamathali Adam, خَلَقَهُ مِن تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ So I, I, I found this, I looked at his research, I thought that this was, based on my research, this was the most conclusive verse that proves that Sayyidina Adam السلام, was directly created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars of Tafsir, they say that there is ijma, this complete consensus, that this verse was revealed um, because the Christians, uh, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, they argued that the, that the uh, virgin birth of of, of Jesus is evidence that he's God. And so uh, the argument of this verse, it goes, it's Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, well, if you believe that the fact that Jesus didn't have a mother makes him God, 
then what about Adam? He didn't have a father or a mother. And you don't say that he's God. And so this is, a, this is an argument against them. And so this verse, what it says, is that part of the argument of the verse is that Sayyidina Adam was created without father or mother. And there's other verses in the Quran that allude to this, and there's hadiths about this as well. So that Sayyidina Adam was is a direct and special creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, a, this is a belief that we have about human beings. As for other animals, there's, there's no evidence in the Quran or Sunnah that, we, that says that, that these animals were created um, as they are. So, what, so as Muslims, so what, we, what we can do is, so the theory of evolution, it, we treat it like uh, any other scientific theory. So, a, a, so let, let's, take, let's take a basic scientific fact, like fire, fire burns, right? Fire burns. Um, you don't need to be much of a scientist, everybody knows fire burns. But we also believe that when Sayyidina Ibrahim was thrown into the fire, it didn't burn him because we believe in miracles. We believe that Allah, and that, and that follows from all of these things, that everything in the universe is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah creates everything directly. And the, when we study science, we study the usual relations between dependent things in the universe, and it falls within the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create things differently. And that when that happens, that's called a miracle. So what we would say is that, uh, that if, so whether evolution is true or false is a scientific, it belongs to the realm of, science, of this scientific reasoning. So someone could come to the conclusion that life forms evolved from an ancestor, from an early ancestor, common ancestors, maybe even a single ancestor. And if they came to that conclusion, then human beings would be a miraculous exception to that rule. So uh, just as, just as uh, fire did not burn uh, uh, miraculously, it was an exception to the rule of, uh, of fire burning with Sayyidina Ibrahim, in this case, this would be a miraculous exception to that rule. And we believe in miracles. So the issue with the theory of evolution is actually not the theory itself. So you don't need to, you don't, Harun Yahya, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Okay? You, don't, you, don't, you don't have to disprove evolution. We don't, we don't, it's not a mission that we need to take. It's actually a huge relief. It should be a huge relief for us because, uh, because, uh, because, um, because it, uh, for, for children, for our children who go and they study in school and they go to university, it's, it's now, this is standard mainstream fact. It's, it's accepted as scientific fact. Now, I'm not, I, I want to leave open the room for people to argue that maybe it's not true. They, they can argue, we can look at the evidence. But theologically, religiously, do we have, are we, it, do we, con, do we, does it conflict with any point of our religious belief to believe that life forms apart from human beings evolved? It doesn't. And, but we believe in miracles. And actually, that's, that's why, that's, this goes back to this question, the problem with science is materialism. Because when you believe in materialism, then you say that miracles are impossible. And so we want to prove that the universe is dependent. It depends on, on the existence of God. God runs everything and miracles are possible. And when you do that, then when you look at a particular scientific fact and you see something in the Quran or Sunnah that goes against that, then we take that as a miraculous exception. And that doesn't conflict with science. But it's rather, it's a, it's a, it's a larger, we're, we're putting science into our, into our worldview. Okay. So just, I, I, so just, I just want to preempt things. So this is something that is very, uh, you get, you know, I, I say this thing, people get emotional. And like, you know, some people are on a mission to d disprove evolution. So it's like, you know, um, I disagree with that. So if you, somebody wants to argue with me, we can argue after. <laughs> is, that, is that it? So we have time for one more question. Uh, anything? Yeah. Salam alaikum. Uh, going back to suffering, when you said uh, there's a reason, uh, the reason, there's no reason for suffering, but isn't suffering supposed to be a test from God that you know we suffer because we're tested? Yeah, that's the reason. So yeah, that's a wisdom. Yeah. It's not a motive. That's a, that's perfect. Uh, 
maybe shall we shall we close here or okay let's let's stop here I, I, I can talk afterwards so I'll be happy to, to talk to you inshallah. so thank you for your um, for your attention